Hello, I'm Pastor Brian, and I want to thank you so much for joining me as we look at God's Word to see His timeless truth. How many of you have just been in anticipation of something and you couldn't wait for it to come? Perhaps it was you were anticipating getting married or you were anticipating a car or getting a job. So many things that we anticipate and those things that we are anticipating are those things that are good. Those things that we desire, that we long for, oftentimes we look to it as that which brings fulfillment in our lives. As we celebrate Christmas, I want to just show you, as we look at the birth story of Jesus, how just this coming of Jesus to be uh, fully, who has always been fully God, taking upon humanity, how this is something that was, uh, in a sense, uh, removed from them in seeing God, but now God is revealing himself through God the Father is revealing himself through Jesus Christ. And we'll take that journey through Scripture as we see what a marvelous gift it is. Let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would give me the words to say, and those that are listening, that you would give them ears to hear the amazing truths that are in Scripture. Lord, it's in your name we do pray. Amen. So let's go ahead and just dive right in. And we're going to dive in in the birth narrative. It, it only occurs really in uh, Matthew and Luke. And then we also are going to, it, it somewhat appears in John, but from a really different perspective. And we'll get into that too. But here, here we have Mary and Joseph and their betrothed. They, they are engaged to get married. And there's all been all these angels and other things that have gone on. But right at the heart of it, Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 7, it says this, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not. Behold. So they had fear, and he said, Fear not. And behold, this is, he is getting to the important message that he is going to bring. I bring to you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. So, this is the message that he has today. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. All right, so it pulling in from the Old Testament, all of this. And what is the so important news is we're getting other information around it. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. So the big news is that there is a Savior, and they are given this child who has, in a unique fashion, been a way in which God is going to reveal himself to not only just the nations, but to all nations and to all people. And so this is exciting news. This is what they were looking for. This is the heart of why we celebrate Christmas is because of the Savior. But to get a better understanding of just all that's going on, let's go ahead and jump all the way back to the beginning of Scripture. In the beginning of Scripture, in Genesis 126, it, it, it's, it says this. And it, it, it lays it out that there's a difference between God and man. And we know that there is. And this is how it says. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So, let us. So, indicating at least more than one. And, and so, this is kind of where we have 
one God in three persons. And we know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have created all things. So one God in three distinct persons. So I think that's the us. And it says, make man in our image after our likeness. So similar, but the image in which God is, we'll go ahead and we'll see that there there is a link that it God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that they're they can they possess uh, one, essentially one nature. They they there's one God, and so that's kind of what we're looking at is that idea that the Creator of the universe has set this in motion. Now. There's a problem. So uh, back in the Old Testament, one, in fact, one who they had been looking uh, towards, or, or they weren't really looking towards him, but in the New, Old, New Testament, they look back towards Moses. And this is kind of Moses after he had found favor. And in fact, Exodus 33, 13 says this. Now, therefore, I have found favor in your sight. So Moses is talking to God. Please show me your ways that I may know you in order that I might find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. So Moses had found favor in God's sight, and he wants to know God more intimately because, first off, he had found favor. He wants to find more favor and that the Israelites were God's chosen people. And so, just a couple verses later, Exodus thirty-three eighteen, 18, Moses says this. Moses said, please show me your glory. Show me who you are. Show me your image. Because Moses wanted to know God wanted to know more of his love, of his justice, of who he is. And look at God's response to that. In Exodus 33, 20, it says this, But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. This all way, goes all the way back to Genesis and the fact that they're, they're, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden because of sin. And in this, we see that God says, all right, you can't see me in this personal way. Otherwise, you're going to die. And we know that seeing somebody face to face and kind of as, as, as Moses was asking, show me your way, show me your glory. God responds, no, I, I can't show you my face. I can't show you my essence. Now, God does not have eyes, ears, and nose. He's, a, he's in a sense, invisible, a non-corporeal being, which, again, creator of all things. But the amazing thing as we celebrate Christmas is that God came down and, and became flesh and blood fully God, fully man. It isn't the understanding of somebody when you can see them face to face so much better than any other way, whether email or, or, or through a, a telephone or through text. Seeing somebody face to face in real life, there's an intimacy that can occur that can't happen through any other way. And so essentially, Moses is saying, I want to know you more. God says, that can't happen. Now, here we go ahead and we'll kind of see how this unfolds, this problem of humanity having been separated from God, wanting to be restored to see God in his face. And this is what we have in John chapter 5, verse 37. It says this, and the Father who sent me uh, has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. So 
And what he's saying is that the Father had, uh, that the incarnation, uh, Jesus came, and, and, and it's essentially we're going to see this revealing of who God the Father is. But we, what we see is the Father had sent himself to bear witness about who he was, and this was going to happen through the incarnation. This is the greatest gift ever, the gift to be able to know God more intimately. And this is happening because the Father sent his Son to be born in a stable to, to, so that we could know him intimately, so that we could see his face. And this is kind of how it unfolds. All right. Let's not move too further. Let's go ahead and look at John chapter 6, uh, verses 46. It says this, Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. So, we see this picture where it's talking about that this is Jesus himself. Jesus knows the Father. Jesus is intimate with the Father. Jesus uh, submits. Jesus uh, communicates does, uh, the, with the Father's will. He does nothing by his own will, but he communicates it th who the Father is. And he is the only one who has had that sense of intimacy there. And so that's kind of what we're looking at. How, how, how can we be part of this? Because we understand the role better about the relationship of God the Father and God the Son. But there, there's a, a sense where we are separated, but God is revealing something to us that is great treasure, that is worth all other things worth selling, all that you have and pursuing after him. And once you find him, getting to know him more intimately about who he is and even looking into the future about our lives and what we desire and what we want. So, Colossians 1.15. In fact, Colossians 1.15 through 20, we looked at a lot of that last week, but this is kind of at the heart of it. He, meaning Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Meaning that kind of as we looked in Genesis when it said, uh, when it talked about let us, that, that he is, he is the exact imprint. And we'll, and we'll look at that more in detail. He is the image of the invisible God. That he is that, and he is above all. When it talks about firstborn, it's not talking about, um, like I talked last week, it's not talking about uh, the first in a race, but like in a science fair, it's not the one who turns in the project first. It's the best project. So that Jesus is far above his rank, his uh, superiority is above all, so that he is first because he is creator. And in fact, it continues on talking about how the, the, seeing the son and seeing the father and how those are related and him and the image of God. He, in talking about Jesus and, and Hebrews, uh, one three says this. It says, he is the radiance of the glory of God. It's not like saying similar or like, it says, it continues on, it says, and the exact imprint of, of his nature. So the exact, the, you're, you're, you're looking there side by side, the exact same as the nature characteristics. Uh, understand there's three persons, but there's one God. And it says the exact imprint of his nature. So the same nature, they're not going to want different things. They're desiring the same thing. And he upholds the universe by his word. So God is a creator and sustainer, therefore making purification for sin. He who sat down at the right hand 
of the majesty on high, that the work is completed. What work? The work of salvation. And remember, from back in Luke, who was, what was this big news? That the Savior has come. And here we see that that is why God sent him to, to live the life that we couldn't be, that he could be the Savior of the world. All of this kind of pointing back to that, but also tying in from Genesis to Revelation, the importance of the work of God. And it doesn't stop there. It, it continues on. In uh, John 1, 14 it says this, and this is kind of like the birth narrative, but from John's perspective. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word Jesus became flesh, and he dwelt tabernacled among us. Remember in the Old Testament, the idea with the tabernacle and the holies of holies being in the presence of God in a special, unique way, knowing God in a special, unique way. Moses saying, hey, I want to see your glory. Hey, you can't do that. And then here we have the idea that Jesus is coming down or came down to earth to dwell among us and we have seen his glory. And that glory is unique to who he is. And then it continues on. First John 1.18 says this. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So understand here, no one has ever seen God. There is only one God, one God in three persons, as we see, uh, who is at the Father's side. And has made him known. So there's a role in which Jesus plays in to reveal the Father. To reveal who he is. And I think this next verse, John 14, 8 and 9, really sum it up. And, and this is one of his disciples, Philip. He's asking that question. And oh, and so important question. Let's go ahead and look at this. John 14, 8 and 9. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. So almost, Philip's saying, I want to have this personal relationship with the God of the universe who created all things, and, and he wants that intimacy to be known, but he, he's not quite getting it yet. And this is Jesus' response. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me? Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you, do you see what Jesus is saying? You see him, you've seen the Father. That, that in knowing Jesus, you know God the Father. Again, one God, three distinct persons, but to know God, to know the creator of the universe is to know Jesus. And, and you know, it's kind of one of these things where throughout scripture, you go, ah, oh, disciples, didn't you get it? And then we look at our own lives and, and we realize that we're a lot like the disciples and that a lot of times we don't get it. See, we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate God revealing himself and Jesus being born there in the stable and uh, in, in all his glory and all of his majesty. And we want to see it. We want to know it. And so I say, hey, you want to know the Father? Know Jesus. And that is true for today. You want to know the God of the universe who created all things. Know Jesus. Cry out to him. Believe in him. And then the amazing thing, you know God. The Holy Spirit dwells within you if you trust in Jesus, if you believe in him. 
You know God. You know the creator of the whole universe. However, I think the scripture points out the problem as well as it points out the solution. The problem can be seen in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So Satan has, has, has blind, blinded the minds of, of uh, unbelievers. In fact, those things that present, them, present themselves as God but aren't really God, they blind us. We, we're too busy following after that. The world is too busy following after things that God created instead of the creator himself. And God has, has blinded the, the, their eyes have been blinded. They can't see. And so, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Jesus is God. You know Jesus. You trust in him. You believe in him. You will know him. You will know of his glory. But the problem is the world is blinded to that. Because they seek after other things. But I think Matthew 5, 8 puts it clearly. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they see God. For, for those who pursue to be pure, to be upright, not in their own efforts, in their own energy, but through trusting and believing in God. Through humbling your heart. It actually, this points to Revelation 22, 4. It says this. The, and this is talking about the eternal state. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. That which we long for, the greatest treasure that we could ever have. To see the face of God. Blinded from seeing it, unable to see it because of sin and the world. God made himself revealed at, at the incarnation, at the, at the birth of Christ. And if you know Jesus, you know the Father. You know the God who created all things. What a great treasure we have in Jesus. So I want to encourage you, as we celebrate Christmas, Realize the greatest treasure we ever have, and that is seeing and knowing Jesus. If you haven't trusted in Jesus, I want to encourage you to trust in Jesus. Cry out to him. Read God's scripture. Ask him to reveal himself to you. For he has revealed himself through the word of God, through scripture. So valuable, so important. And if you have trusted in Jesus, continue to know of his glory. Continue to be pure in heart, to pursue righteousness. Call out to God. Know him by knowing his word, having a deep relationship with him. For it is the greatest treasure we could ever have. And we look forward to the day when we will be able to see his face and his name will be on our foreheads. That we will have that intimacy with God that is so precious that it's worth all that we have to seek and to have him. Thank you so much for taking time to go through God's word with me. Let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer, asking him just to guide us and direct us and to draw us closer to himself, that we would see him more clearly. Dear Lord, we thank you for the revelation that we have in your word. Lord, I pray that we would know you more intimately. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. It's in your name we do pray. Amen.
Thank you so much. And I pray that you have a blessed Christmas.